Brian Callahan is assembling an all-star coaching staff in Nashville for the Titans. We're going to break down the hires that we know about and maybe speculate on a few other positions. This is the Music City Audible. Let's get to it. Welcome everyone to another episode of the Music City Audible podcast presented by Broadway Sports Media in partnership with 440 Sports. I'm Justin Graver. With me as always is Justin Mello. Yesterday we talked to Zach Lyons about the Senior Bowl and some guys to to watch for the Titan specific Titan team fits. We had a great debate about the offensive line versus wide receiver, you know, positional value at that number seven overall pick. So make sure you check out that episode if you missed it. But today we are talking about Brian Callahan's coaching staff, at least the pieces that we know so far who have been hired. To our knowledge, there have been six official hires onto Brian Callahan's staff, including offensive coordinator, wide receivers coach, offensive line coach, defensive coordinator, DB's coach and linebackers coach. So we're going to break down each guy going through their history and what they can bring to the Titans and why this is an all-star staff. So let's start on the offensive side of the ball with probably the least exciting name in maybe one of the more important positions, and that will be offensive coordinator Nick Holtz. We talked about him a little bit, Justin, when we were going through the interview candidates uh, last week's show, and we, we were, you know, two of the guys that we talked about last week ended up getting hired. But what do you know, what can, what more can you tell us that we didn't say last week about Nick Holtz? And I think the way to frame this is, convince me that this is a good hire. <laughs> well, I'm not going to because I'm extremely skeptical, right? I'm just <laughs> going to be honest. I'm very skeptical. Um, he's got one year of, of coordinate, co- offensive coordinator experience under his belt. It came at the collegiate level in 2022 at UNLV. Uh, not exactly a high-ranking program. Um, was the passing game coordinator for the Jacksonville Jaguars this past season, divisional rival. Uh, look, there was a lot that went into it. We'd both, I think we'd agree, you know, Trevor Lawrence was banged up, but no one here thought that that passing game, that that quarter, franchise quarterback took the step forward that they expected him to. And again, it would be very, very silly to put all that on him, but we're just, these are the facts. This is what happened essentially, right? Uh, we know he got his start in coaching under, Daddy Callahan, Bill Callahan in 2007 at Nebraska, spent a lot of time in Oakland slash Las Vegas with the Raiders. Probably the best part of his resume. I think I mentioned it last time out. He survived four coaching changes there. Right. Briefly coached with Brian Callahan there in, uh, I think they were in Vegas already. And of course, as you, you probably know already, these guys are like really good friends going back to high school, high school football teammates. He, he's definitely hired someone that he knows to be a friend and someone that he trusts And um, I'll say this, I can't believe, look, everyone's so excited right now, and I get it. I'm excited too. I'm very excited about Brian Callahan, the coaching staff, but I can't believe how many people were jumping in my my mentions, excuse me, to sort of blindly defend this hire. Um, I've got questions about it, that's all. I think what, what irked me the most, I found it so ironic that everyone was like, well, he's not calling plays. He's not calling plays. Brian, who cares? Brian Callahan's calling plays. And yeah, it's it's nice that he's not calling plays, that Brian Callahan's calling plays. But I find it so odd to sort of diminish that when you just hired a head coach that didn't call plays, right, as an right. offensive coordinator. Like, you had no problem with that, and you shouldn't because it's not a prerequisite to becoming a very good head coach. And I think Brian Callahan has all the tools to be a very good head coach, right? All I'm saying is I'm giving the honest two cents here is that I'm not sold on this hire. It's the one that inspires me the least by far of all the hires that he's made. I I think they had a better candidate in Eric Studesville, who we talked about quite a bit, who we did interview. And let's call it what it is. Um, They interviewed the bare minimum candidates for this position, by the way. Right? Three in-person interviews. Two of them were minority. That we were were reporting. We're aware of. That we're aware of. Which is likely all of them, but just a caveat. (laughs) They interviewed the bare minimum. From what we know, right? So uh, usually when that happens, it, it, it may indicate a decision had been made, right? Potentially. So I've got quite, and look, I'm going to say this as well, uh, because I find it so funny that everyone was jumping in my mentions. If this offense doesn't meet expectations, this fan base is going to turn on Nick Holtz faster than you can snap your fingers. Yeah. Angry. Okay. Faster than you can snap your fingers. Okay, so all I'm trying to do is have, and I hope it doesn't come to that, is have a little foresight. If you're complaining about the hire then, you should be complaining about it now. Right. Exactly. Okay. Is, what I'm, is all I'm saying. 
So you did a horrible job of convincing me why this is a good move. So let I need me, to be convinced through the results. Let me do my best to to do that convincing now. So first, I'm going to share just some raw numbers. This is you know small sample size, of course, but I'm going to look at this is something that Zach, who was our guest on yesterday's show at F Words Pod, tweeted out last week. So looking at Trevor Lawrence in 2022 under offensive coordinator Jim Bob Cooter versus 2023 under passing game coordinator and you know presumably working very closely with Nick Holtz. Well they had another OC, right? This past year. So I, I don't know that that's a fair It's it's he was the passing game coordinator and I'm looking at passing numbers here. So he wasn't calling the plays obviously, but you would assume that he had a very large part in designing the offense and trying to get the most out of Trevor Lawrence. So in and Jim Bob Cooter was passing game coordinator, not offensive coordinator. So sorry for the, the oh. confusion there. Um so in 2022 the Jaguars average 0.137 EPA per pass play, 0.137, with a 50.8 success rate in 2023. From weeks 1 to 13, and I think this is important context because we're looking at Trevor Lawrence's season last year, and everybody wants to talk about how he needs to take another step. He, it was disappointing that he didn't take that step. The Jags collapsed down the stretch. All those things are true. But also, Lawrence was dealing with some pretty significant injuries from his upper body to his lower body. We're trying that to he suffered, yeah. Yes, of course. That he suffered in week 13. So we're looking at weeks 1 through 13, pre-injury. 0.137 EPA per play under Jim Bob Cooter in 2022. 0.156 EPA per play from weeks 1 through 13 in 2023. That's a pretty substantial jump in EPA per play. Now, it doesn't mean everything, of course. It's just one little data point to help try to convince you that Nick Holtz is not going to be terrible at his job. Maybe, can I just cut in mm -hmm. here? Maybe Nick Holtz was calling all the good passing plays like Tim <laughs> Kelly was calling when he was the passing game coordinator. Yeah, I, I get what you're saying there, but there is a substantial increase there. So sure, they added Calvin Ridley, who by all accounts was a disaster in Jacksonville in terms of his attitude off the field and his production was extremely inconsistent all season. So is that a good thing that they added Calvin Ridley or could there be some negatives there? And then from weeks 14 through 18 playing hurt, the EPA per play dropped all the way down to minus 0.075 per drop back. That's pretty horrendous. Um, but I think hurt. a lot of that can be attributed to hurt. injury. Yeah, exactly. He was hurt. So that's one data point to look at. The passing game for Jacksonville improved when they moved from Jim Bob Cooter, passing game coordinator, to Nick Holtz as passing game coordinator. That's that's a positive data point that can help convince you. The other side of this is you mentioned a lot about how this is a guy that Brian Callahan knows and feels he can trust. And I think that that's really important. A, we've heard this word all offseason since Mike Vrabel was fired, collaboration. We know that they want collaboration in the front office. They want collaboration between Rand Carthon and Brian Callahan. But Brian Callahan also wants collaboration on his staff. So in his first time ever as a head coach, Hiring someone that he knows and trusts that he's known basically his whole life is going to enhance that collaboration aspect. And if you think that Nick Holtz is going to be the Brian Callahan to Zach Taylor, what Brian Callahan was to Zach Taylor, Nick Holtz is going to be to Brian Callahan now. You want someone in that role that you fully trust and that you feel like your philosophies with in football are completely Absolutely. aligned. Because he's going to have to do a lot of the things that Brian Callahan was doing in Cincinnati yep. is now going to fall to Nick Holtz. And Callahan's going to be like, I need a me. I need someone who was me to Zach Taylor that I really trust. So I like it from that standpoint. I also get the criticism of like, oh, you're all, they're hiring their buddies again. It's like, can you just go get a real coach instead of hiring your friends? But like, that's, this is the league. This is what coaches that's in what, the league do. You no, know, you should. <laughs> I want to make that clear. I think coaches should hire people that they know and trust. Right. right? I think they should just all I was saying was keep that same energy when every other coach does it. Right. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. They should. I believe that they should. OK, because you know what? I th This is only one example, but uh, it will drive my point home. You know who didn't do that last year? The Carolina Panthers. OK, they assembled an all star coaching staff. Frank Reich didn't know a lot of them. Right? right, like he wants to go get Thomas Brown, who runs a totally different offense than he does. He wants to get Deuce Staley, Antoine Randall L, like all these guys that he was not familiar with. It seems like he was pressured it, at the time, it sounded like by Dave Tepper to sort of assemble this all star coaching staff. And by week nine or 10, you know what happens when you're not winning? Okay. And this, and Cincinnati, by the way, Brian Callahan talked about that first year being like what, 0 and 6, 1 and 7, whatever it was. Not, not a lot of fun to be in the building when your record is that record. How important it is to surround yourself with people 
that you trust 100 percent right. because you know what happened in carolina when they were 0 and 7 0 and 8 and they and they didn't have that trust established from previous stops there were reports out fired. there <laughs> sorry everyone got fired <laughs> not only did everyone get fired but there were reports out there that there were coaches that felt like they were being backstabbed by other mm. coaches in the building because you know what when it's sink or swim and you don't really have a relationship with that guy and you don't give a shit about that guy and the relationship, the personal relationship that you have with that guy, you have no accountability to whether he or he keeps or loses his job. That makes a huge difference on how the building conducts itself, essentially. So, yeah, I think coaches should hire guys they're familiar with. I just thought he had there were candidates that were better suited to that role that he was familiar with. Everyone I called out that I was hoping what he was familiar with, right? Like yeah, Eric right. Studsville, he was extremely familiar. Six years together in Denver. And we don't know what happened behind the scenes. If they reached out to Studsville, interviewed him, offered him the job, and he said, you know what, for now I'm going to stay in Miami. You know, I think we're building something here. Maybe it was Nick Holtz all along, which I think you can assume because of the relationship he has with Brian Kelly. And so we, we'll never know the answer to that. But yes, just to say, we don't fully know. Um, the last thing I'll say about Nick Holtz, and it's a point you already made, but I think it bears repeating. He survived four coaching, three and a half to four coaching changes in Las Vegas. That is, I mean, that shows that he knows his stuff and that people liked working with him and believed in him to keep him around. And two of two of them, sorry, were defensive minded, right? The first one was Dennis Allen. The second was Jack Del Rio. Uh, then the third was John Gruden, who, uh, you know, we know is well versed in that sort of West Coast offense, right? That right. that. That daddy Callahan in my is that was weird. I think I'm going to keep calling it. It's probably strange, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> that da- daddy Callahan helped uh, is what well, well, I would call. I would call Bill Callahan one of the godfathers. I think of that West Coast offense. So and Gruden's obviously very well versed in it as well. So not shocked he kept them on staff at that time, but certainly a good sign. Right. So anyway, uh, that that's my attempt to convince you that Nick Holtz was a good hire, even though I'm still skeptical myself. Let's move on and talk about wide receivers coach Tyke Tolbert, who, r- by all reports that were out there when this move was made, had two other offers. I don't know if we know who those two other offers were. I think the were, Giants but, were mentioned as one, I think. Yeah. Um, to be wide receivers coach somewhere else. And he chose to come work for Brian Callahan in Tennessee. I mean, knowing what the Titans wide receiver room looks like and everything like Brian Callahan being a first time head coach. I think it says a lot that he chose to come work for Brian Callahan here. It's not like there is a ton of talent that he's going to get credit for molding. I mean, Deandre Hopkins is an all pro future hall of famer, but he's not going to get credit for developing him obviously, because he's going to be 32 years old this year. And then you have guys that are like Traylon Burks, Kyle Phillips, like guys that you're not necessarily expecting anything out of anymore because they've had two seasons to prove it and just haven't been either healthy enough or productive enough or both, for, I guess, for both of them. So f- the fact that he chose to come to Tennessee, great sign for what Brian Callahan is building. But also, this guy has a sterling, sterling track record. He's been working with wide receivers since 2003. He was the wide receivers coach for rookie Anquan Bolden. He was That's wide crazy. receivers coach for rookie Lee Evans. I mean, these are names that you're going to be like, oh, I had him on my fantasy team when I was 12 years old. Yeah, that, that, those kind of names. Um, um, Eric Decker when he was a rookie. Um, Demarius Thomas when he was a young player. There, the, the list goes on and on of guys that he worked with when they were young, developing receivers. And rookie wide receivers in particular have produced at an exceptionally high level under Tyke Tolbert, including guys like Darius Slayton drafted in the fifth round, right? So I think that this is an interesting guy to come in and try to get the most out of Traylon Burks and Kyle Phillips. And there's going to be a lot of Titans fans who are like, oh, th- this is going to be a breakout year for these guys. I'm not pushing that bandwagon. I'm looking more <laughs> at you draft. You're going to draft a wide receiver this year, Tennessee Titans fans. Yes, You're going to draft one, whether it's Malik Neighbors, Romo Dunze at number seven, or one of these many, many names that it's very hard to predict who will be there in the second round, like an A.D. Mitchell, Xavier Worthy, Xavier Leggett, all these other names. This is a guy that's going to be able to get them up to speed quickly and allow them to be contributors and productive receivers in their first year because he has a track record of doing that with rookie wide receivers. So I am ecstatic about Tyke Tolbert. Um, If you guys are familiar with Emery Hunt, he went on Twitter the other day and called Tyke Tolbert the best wide receiver coach in the game. He this played for praise. him, by the way. Everyone keeps forgetting that part. of He actually played for Tyke Tolbert in college. So right. that's probably where that comes from. And it makes me take the evaluation a little more seriously, also a little less seriously, right? Because uh, <laughs> probably got a great relationship with him. But but that, that's one thing people keep forgetting. He actually played for him. Yeah. So any thoughts, any further thoughts on Tyke Tolbert? 
Yeah, quickly, one thing you didn't mention is, again, uh, a long-lasting relationship with Brian Callan. They spent five or six years together in Denver, probably that Eric Decker rookie year that you talked about. Uh, Brian Callahan was on that staff when Ty Tolbert was the wide receivers coach. No, I, I think it's a, it's a good hire, a very good hire. Uh, I, I thought Rob Moore was a good receivers coach. I'm not saying that to say I, I'm mad that he's gone or I felt they downgraded. No, uh, I think they replaced a good receivers coach with another really good receivers coach. So uh, one that, again, he's familiar with, which makes sense. So, no, I think that's a, an outstanding hire. So, yeah, very excited for what Tyke Tolbert can bring. And, again, just want to reiterate, he turned down two other jobs to come to Tennessee. He was a highly coveted guy. That'll Probably be... because of the relationship. Yes, exactly. And that'll be a bit of a theme that emerges as we continue on here. So the next hire we're going to talk about, we're going to finish up with our last offensive hire here, is Bill Callahan. Maybe the best get out of all of them. The sure. offensive line guru. He was with the Browns. The Browns let him out of his contract to come coach in the same position for his son. I think that's, first of all, just a really cool thing. Kevin Stefanski spoke about that in a press conference, I believe, on Monday, talking about how this is a very unique situation. And every every child's dream is to boss around their parents. So <laughs> making a joke there about how Brian Callahan will boss around his dad now. Um but Bill Callahan, I mean, what more can we say that hasn't already been said by so many people? Just one of the best offensive line coaches to ever coach in the NFL. Maybe yep. the best. Uh, like, like you said, one of the, the grandfathers of the West Coast outside zone run scheme. A guy who helped develop a lot of blocking techniques for that scheme. That I mean, if you paid attention this past season, you may know the Cleveland Browns were on their second and third stringers across the offensive line. And rarely did you see much of a drop off. I mean, from Jack Conklin, all pro caliber player to whoever the hell was backing him up, there was not a whole lot of drop off seen from the Cleveland Browns offensive line. Their run game has been very good. We know they're going to get the most out of, you know, the run game guys like obviously Nick Chubb is very talented, but he goes down early in the year. Yep. Browns run game hardly skips a beat. So there's just not much more you can say. I do. And they I started do, four different quarterbacks. And they started, year. well, five, five if you count week 18, Jeff Driscoll. But um, well, <laughs> I thought one, he waited four. Jeez. That, that one barely Watson. counts. I think you're right. I think PJ Washington, Joe Flacco, um, the rookie Jeff from Driscoll, UCLA. And yeah. So I just think, you know, this is going to be a big point of contention now amongst Titans fans. And you've been dealing with it in your Twitter mentions already, oh, Justin. Is I'm already annoyed. <laughs> the Titans will need to draft any offensive lineman now. Yep. They can just sign a bunch of UDFAs and keep yep. the guys on the roster. And Bill Callahan is going to coach them all up into all pros. Right? Right? I, I, hey, I, if that's the case, I, I wouldn't mind. I'm ready to suit up myself. I'll take a seven hundred, eight hundred thousand dollar minimum. I'll come play. You know I think I mean? Bill Callahan could make me an All Pro left tackle, and I've never played the position in my life. So right. I mean, <laughs> and look, obviously we're exaggerating a little. No one's quite saying that, but I am seeing way too much faith in my mentions in Nicholas Petit Friere and Dylan Radins and Daniel Brunskill. Those three seem to be consistently like, oh, you know, if two of them are starting. I think one of them should be starting at most, right? Just one. And it should be Radens or Brunskill, maybe at right guard, right? For me, I would upgrade left tackle, right tackle, center this offseason. And I, I don't I can understand letting Brunskill Radens compete at right guard. May the best man win. May, or maybe that's you get a better right guard and it's Brunskill versus a rookie center or something along those lines. I get one of those guys being in contention, but I think if you're starting both of them, you, you probably haven't had the offseason you should have, even with the granddaddy of them all coming in to coach the O-line. Uh, look, it's a 10 out of 10 hire. I'm not selling it short. I'm very excited about this hire. Um, I, I love the system. I've always been a big fan of it since since they brought in uh, Matt LaFleur and replaced him with Art Smith. It was essentially the system they were running. So uh, it's a system I believe in, and maybe I'm going to show my – maybe I'm a little too young here And by saying this. No one considers me young. But uh, it's an offense, in my opinion, that obviously was established long time under Callahan, under uh, – uh, Mike Shanahan and everything. I feel like it's in its second renaissance, right? I don't remember. I, re I feel like there was a period where it wasn't quite as popular as it is now, right? Mm -hmm. I, again, I mean, ever since Kyle Shanahan and Sean McVay have become head coaches and, and so many, look, so many, it's a product of so many of their assistant coaches have gone on to be head coaches elsewhere, uh, or even position coaches have become offensive coordinators elsewhere. You look at guys like Thomas Brown and Zach Robinson. There's so many of them. Uh, that, that system, it feels like they've got its hand in, in at least 33% 
of offenses around the league right now, right? The New York Jets with Robert Salah and the people he's hired, and we can go on and on. Um, Minnesota Vikings with uh, Kevin O'Connell. There's so many of them, but uh, it's certainly a system I've always had a lot of love and affinity for, and I'm extremely excited because they've kind of shifted away from it a little, right, these past couple of years. They haven't been as outside zone heavy. It it wasn't Tim Kelly's thing per se, right? That's not the system he grew up in, Mm -hmm. so to speak. So they they, And even Todd Downing was – sort of multiple right he had exposure to a couple different systems so i'm really excited that they're going to hopefully get back to their roots here uh and start running a lot more uh hopefully outside zone under uh brian and bill callahan yeah i agree and i think when it comes to like the talent development aspect of this hire there's two ways to look at it the first is what i just joked about how he's going to make all the guys currently on the roster all pros the more realistic way to look at it is yes. if you draft a high traits high yes. ceiling player like a Joe Alt, Olaf Ashanu, or even like a Tyler Guyton from Oklahoma somewhere in the mid mid to late first round, that you would expect Bill Callahan to coach up these players with the high right. traits, high ceiling, to reach that high ceiling. Exactly. What is Dylan Radins? What is NPFs? What is their ceiling after being in the league for multiple years and seeing them on the field? It's a lot different than looking at a, a, you know, a raw draft prospect and saying, well, they could reach really big heights. The guys that have been in the league that we've seen play – yeah, he's going to make him a little better for sure. That's what the whole point of like, that's what he's done everywhere he's been. Is he going to make them starting caliber? <laughs> Maybe. Is he going to make them all pros? Probably almost, almost a hundred percent. No. So exactly. I think exactly, right. exactly. Instead of talking about P, uh, friggin' Dylan Raiden to Daniel Brunskill, Nicholas Petit Freire, you should be jumping in my mentions and talking about what this means to Peter Skaronsky, right. who's got the baseline traits to potentially be an all pro player. What this means to a Joe Alt or Olu Fashanu, like you said, if you draft them at number seven overall, that's where this hire pays dividends. It's making those guys reach their potential because the potential actually has to be there in the first place. And I don't think it's there with some of those guys that are on the Titans roster right now. I agree. And I'll go back to something that Zach said on the show yesterday about a, a raw player like Patrick Paul is that that that's another guy that I think Bill Callahan could coach up. Now, the, the thing is you have to weigh here is so when you draft, typically you're drafting for the future. You're not drafting for the right. current season that you're about to play. You're drafting for the next three to five or more years. Will the Titans take that approach? How quickly do they see this program turning around? Because if they want it to turn around immediately, they're going to need contributions from the rookie class in addition to the free agents they sign. If they're looking to build a sustained long-term success, they should take guys that they feel are going to be starters and high-level contributors in year two and beyond. So that's where I think... It's going to be very interesting to see philosophically what they do. If they take a wide receiver in the first round and a high upside developmental tackle in the second round, then you're looking at maybe a bit of a longer term rebuild. Maybe the 2024 season is not your most competitive as you build up to 2025. And that is a potential avenue they could take. It may not be the most exciting for Titans fans to sit through another full season 2024 where you're not in, you're not going to win a Super Bowl, but are they going to win a Super Bowl anyway next? Like, is a one year Super Bowl run really realistic? And how much does that matter when you're talking about what a successful season means? So to me, I can't wait to see what they do and how they use Bill Callahan. If they, if they go with a Joe Alt, extremely high upside blue chipper guy like that, or if they go with one of these, you know, high risk, high low floor, high ceiling type of guys in the later, later rounds of the draft, or how many offensive linemen do they take? I mean, is there a situation where they take a tackle in the first round and a center, Jackson Powers Johnson, if he doesn't go in the first round or somebody like that in the second? And then in the fourth round, you come back and get your right tackle. I mean, do they go all in on something like that? I would be fairly surprised, but I, I, I'm i saying right now, I'm not ruling anything out with how they decide to approach the offensive line now that Bill Callahan is the guy. Well, the conversation changes a little with a new regime, right? Because I, I, there's a chance that, you know, Brian Callahan, uh, even Rand Carthon, who we we gather wasn't fully in charge per se, they might not care a lot about what happened last year and the year before, right? Like it's 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 a new regime in right. that sense. But uh, you know, if if Mike Vrabel was still here, for example, I think there'd be a notion of uh, or more of a notion that we have botched this left tackle position so hard two years in a row. We've got to get it right, and we've got to get it right right now. Right. So maybe Brian Callahan doesn't feel that kind of pressure because it was, you know, Dennis Daly is not on him and Andre Dillard is not on him. Right. But I mean, with Rand Carthon, the Andre Dillard, you're still going to bring it back to him a little. Mm-hmm. So he should be feeling some of that pressure. 
I think, after what happened with that left tackle this past year. Uh, but it is interesting. I do think there's a bit of a shift in that conversation where Brian Callahan can be like, I'm not the one that botched left tackle two years in a row. You know what I mean? So, uh, but certainly, um, it, it, I would think if it was the previous staff, you'd feel more pressure to get it right immediately with like a Joe Walter or an Olu Kashan. I would argue they botched the left tackle position four years in a row, going back to 2020 <laughs> Isaiah Wilson. But yes, agreed overall. I mean, with you, they drafted him to be a right tackle, but that's fair. Um, and then there's also the the. I mean, we keep talking about this philosophical wide receiver versus offensive line thing. There is also a lot of rumors going around that Rand Carthon wanted to take Zay Flowers at 11 and was overruled, and that's how Peter Skronsky ended up on the Titans. If that's the case, and Rand Carthon is a wide receiver over offensive line guy and Brian right. Callahan appears a little bit to be based on all the comments he's made and his history with, you know, being on the Jamar chase side of the Panay Sewell debate, um, that he's also wide receiver over offensive line type of guy. And then you bring in Bill Callahan, who's an offensive line guru who's going to coach up anyone you put out there. They're, they are laying the groundwork for me to be extremely unsurprised if they do decide to draft a wide receiver at, at number seven as opposed to an offensive lineman. I still think the best way to build the best offensive line is to take a tackle there, but we will we will see how it play, how it shakes out. One last point I want to make about this is that in Rand Carthon's sort of end-of-season press conference after Mike Vrabel was fired and they put him on the podium to take a bunch of questions that he couldn't answer and to not talking about the vision and saying, I think Miss Amy said that in her statement and all the, the press conference that many people lambashed for being a horrible look for the organization <laughs> right before they hired Brian Callahan. He did say one thing that was very interesting to me. He said, because they were asking him a lot about the offensive line and the failures of the offensive line, and Moran Carthon deflected and said, you know, we had to deal with a lot of injuries and there's a lot of moving pieces. But then he, when he was pressed, I think it was Paul Kaharski who continued to press the what? issue. He turned back and said, we know that we got to upgrade that position this offseason. He said that. So... That I mean, that's obvious, but he said it like that, saying it's a huge priority to upgrade the offensive line be. this offseason, and as it should be. But if it's really that huge of a priority, maybe that is an indicator that they want to take a tackle at seven. So anyway, long discussion there to say we have no idea what they're going to do, and uh, there's a lot of ways they could go. And I think they could be successful depending on what the players turn out to be. There's no right answer right now, right? We, we'll see how it all shakes out. So. Let's flip this over to the defensive side of the ball and talk about what I think is the second biggest get of the coaching staff hire so far. Defensive coordinator Denard Wilson had offers from at least three other teams. We know for sure the Packers, the Rams, and the Giants wanted to hire Denard Wilson as, as defensive coordinator. I'm going to assume that the Ravens, the Ravens ended up promoting linebackers coach Zach Orr to the defensive corner position. That was after Denard Wilson took the job with the Titans, so we don't know if he had an offer on the table from Baltimore. We don't know if he had an offer on the table from Mike McDonald to follow him to Seattle. We'd assume he would want to sort of separate himself to position himself to be a future head coach. And if he's just calling Mike McDonald's defense in Seattle, maybe that doesn't. So anyway, at least three, maybe four, maybe five offers to be defensive coordinator in the league. And he chose to come coach the Tennessee Titans. He is a guy that has been called an up and coming, fast rising coach, a future superstar coach, a future head coach guy that has gotten the most out of his defenses everywhere. He's been the DB coach. And now Granted, he's only been the DB coach, and I've seen people on Twitter get very confused by this. Somebody tweeted that he got Jadavion Clowney to have yeah. a, a, a career season when he couldn't do anything in Tennessee. It's like, you know he didn't have anything to do with the edge rushing position in Baltimore. Very little. Yeah, he had very little to do with it. But, um, but hey, coverage sacks. Right? Yes. <laughs> I, that's, why, that's why I changed from what you said to very little, but <laughs> certainly nowhere near deserving full credit. But we did talk a lot about Denard Wilson on our last podcast, so I encourage people to go back and listen to that. There's It's time-coded, so if you want to jump right to our Denard Wilson discussion, go back to last week talking about the coaching staff options and uh, find our conversation there. But I just want to say it is a huge get that the Titans managed to snag Denard Wilson and convince him to come coach in Tennessee. It, it, it's a very good hire. It's one of those you know first-time coordinator hires. I don't think I could be more excited for a first-time coordinator hire because there's always a little unknown when that happens, but certainly this guy's resume. I mean, I think there's there's clips floating around Twitter of him talking about learning under Todd Bowles and Greg Williams. And I, I mentioned last week, Jeff Fisher is who he got his start under uh, in coaching. I talked about how uh, the Philly offense got a lot worse after he left. The Baltimore defense got a lot better 
when he arrived, right? So uh, I, I think certainly it's an extremely exciting hire. Uh, a lot of defensive process, a lot of defensive free agents, excuse me, out there that have great ties to him. A Geno Stone, uh, Patrick Queen's been mentioned. I think I've seen C.J. Gardner Johnson talked about. They were in Philly together in 2022 right. when Gardner Johnson led the league in interceptions, right? So there are a lot of great players uh, that have a lot of great ties to Denard Wilson. And one other thing, this might be stupid, but I'm going to say it. And I don't think it's stupid. Uh, <laughs> If Sean McVay wanted to hire him, that gives me so much more confidence when you look at the success that Sean McVay has had hiring assistant coaches throughout. I mean, how many of them have become coordinators, head coaches? It's stupid, right? I mean, yeah. how many did he lose this year? I think Raheem Morris obviously just went. Zach Robinson. did. Uh, I think the Jake Peets or something along those lines might have gotten a job somewhere else. Like, it is just stupid every year, uh, the coaching staff that Sean McVay puts together. So that gives me, even uh, you said he had an offer from Green Bay. I think Matt LaFleur has done a terrific job assembling uh, his staff throughout his time there uh, with the Packers. So uh, this is definitely an out- outstanding hire that I'm, I'm very excited about. And this and this is where, you know, between him, Tolbert, and Brian Callahan, this is why I've been calling it an all-star coaching staff because these three guys in particular Right. All had other options. I mean, obviously, Bill Callahan was already under contract. I mentioned Tyke Tolbert had two other offers and Denard Wilson with at least three other offers. Like, these are guys that other teams and good organizations around the league, like yeah. you mentioned, the Packers, the Rams, wanted to hire these guys, and yet they decided to come to Tennessee instead. So, all-star coaching staff. And now I'm going to say, I don't know if the, that might be the end of, like, the all-star qualifications here for the, the coaching staff. Let's talk quickly about linebackers coach, Frank Bush and DB coach Steven Jackson, both guys returning to the Titans organization here from previous stints in their career. Um, I don't know a whole lot about them, so I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, Steve Jackson. I, it's funny. I recognized both names immediately because I've got pretty good memory when it comes to these things. Jackson, first of all, one of the few guys that played for the Houston Oilers, the Tennessee Oilers, and the Tennessee Titans because he played from 91 to 99. For the franchise. So he was there for it all. And, you know, I'll put my hand up. Uh, I wasn't watching them in 91. What I remembered him from, the name from that is, is he was the assistant DB coach in 2016, 2017. I guess under Mike Malarkey, that would have been. So uh, certainly the name rung a bell. You know, uh, I think 2022, by the way, worked with Art Smith as the senior offensive assistant for the Falcons, and then was the secondary coach, uh, I believe, for the Falcons. So uh, this past year, this past year, they took a big step forward. And a lot of that, I think, should go to Ryan Nielsen, the D.C., did a really good job. They brought in Jesse Bates in free agency. So there's a huge uh, influx of talent that got injected uh, in Atlanta, both on the coaching side and the player side, I, I think, in the back, in the defensive backfield. But certainly, by all accounts, Steve Jackson did a good job. I find it super interesting, again, that he was a senior offensive assistant in 2022. Um, one thing that I really like about him, by the way, forget all the connections to the Titans, the Oilers, the city of Nashville. Um, he worked with Denard Wilson in New York when Wilson was with, uh, with Todd Bowles and the Jets. I think Greg Williams was the D.C. He was the assistant DB coach. Uh, with the Jets that one year, uh, for two years, excuse me. And then when he left the Jets, you know where he went? He went to work with Brian Callahan in Cincinnati. He was the secondary slash cornerbacks coach for two seasons. So I like that he has ties to both Callahan and Wilson. I like that he's been coaching DB since like 2001. There's a lot Mm -hmm. of experience here. I'm going to tie that point in at the end. Um, Do you want me to just go on to Frank Bush? Please. Another name that I knew I recognized immediately, and then when I looked him up, uh, you know, as soon as we heard that he was hired or report that he was hired from Teron Davenport, uh, I was like, wait, I know why I know this name. First of all, he played for the Oilers for two years, 85, 86. Okay, we're going way back here. He became their linebackers coach for two years in the early 90s, and then he returned to coach linebackers for them in 2011, 2012. Now, why did that happen? You may recall when the Titans gave Mike Munchak the head coaching job, he hired a lot of guys that he played with in right. Houston. Didn't seem like Mike Munchak had a very uh, extensive reach to hire coaches. And, and I remember Bruce Matthews coached here for a while. All kinds of guys that played on those Oilers teams with Munchak came here to coach. And Frank Bush was one of them. Um, lately, he has been with the Falcons as well, by the way. So he joins here from the Falcons. So same thing where Steve Jackson was. So they're coming together. And the other thing, by the way, is he's also got ties um, to Denard Wilson. They spent time together under Jeff Fisher 
uh, back in St. Louis with the L and the Jets, I think, actually. I think Frank Bush spent two different stints with Denard Wilson. The first wow. one in St. Louis under Jeff Fisher, and then again uh, under uh, in, the, in New York with the Jets uh, under Todd Bowles and Greg Williams. So uh, I find it a little funny and a little odd that he's back for a third coaching stint here, his fourth overall with the franchise, considering he played for them. And by the way, he was a scout when he retired. He scouted for like five or six years for the Oilers before mm. he decided to get into coaching instead. But um, uh, a little weird. I mean, but you know what? Last time he coached here, unfortunately, it was under like the Tommy Smith rain so he's not even back under the same owner technically yeah. right so i think that takes some of the weirdness out of it although i don't know how much weirdness there'd be between a position coach and the owner certainly there would be between a head coach and the owner but uh, he's here for his third stint an extensive resume as i said got his coach started coaching in 93 uh, after spending five years as a scout uh, essentially for the franchise so um wh- what i wanted to tie in when i talked about steve jackson is uh this is not a mistake that they have hired two defensive coaches who are veteran coaches that have been coaching for a very long time, have a ton of coaching experience that both know Denard Wilson. And I think that's going to be invaluable to him as a first time, first year defensive coordinator. And by the way, they're doing the same thing on the offensive side of the ball. This is not by mistake. This is by design. Okay. You've got a first time head coach and play caller, right? In Brian Callahan, you've got a first time offensive coordinator in Nick Holtz, uh, first time NFL offensive coordinator. You know what I mean? Uh, but now you've got Tyke Tolbert who's been coaching receivers for 25 years, whatever it is. And you've got Bill Callahan as the O-line coach who, who literally helped give birth to the head coach. So, uh, so I, I think this is by design. Certainly Bill Callahan by- has been coaching offensive linemen maybe for longer than you and I have been alive combined. Yes. Not, not combined, but <laughs> maybe not combined, but, <laughs> but certainly definitely- longer, uh, yeah. Almost as long as Brian Callen's been alive, probably, yeah. right? So um, I think this is by design, and I love it. Because I talked about on Twitter, see, I'm so damn smart. People were getting mad at me. Like, I was a little worried about the experience on this staff when it first started coming together. And uh, I think they agreed with my sentiment. And that's why they went out and get two offensive assistant coaches with a wealth of experience and two defensive assistant coaches that not only have a wealth of experience, but have a lot of experience with the DC. And by the way, I should mention the offensive ones also have a lot of experience with Callahan, right? It's if you forgot that, right? I talked with about both, with both Tyke Callahan's. Tolbert, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Tyke Tolbert coached for so long in Denver with Brian Callahan. So this is not a mistake. It is fully by design and it is smart because experience on a coaching staff matters. Okay. I'll tell you a quick story. You're going to think it's an extreme example. It doesn't matter, but it always sticks in my mind. I remember when the Denver Broncos hired Nathaniel Hackett. Okay. I was sitting in a work meeting with my pal, Joe Marino. Okay. And he was the first one. Okay. This is way back again, when they first hired him and the staff was coming together in Denver, Joe Marino, my pal was the only one that said, I'm a little worried about the experience of this staff. If you look at who Nathaniel Hackett is hiring, he didn't go out and get a lot of experienced coaches. Not at all. And I didn't see that sentiment mentioned anywhere else. What happened with the Denver Broncos that year? Okay. It was a disaster, not only from a play calling perspective, it might've been the worst in-game management we have ever seen because he didn't have anyone he could look to, to the left or right of him that had been in those situations before. And Mm -hmm. I always remember that because Joe Marino called it out seven months before it started happening. And it's not something I had seen floating around Twitter or anything at the time. Okay. So that's always something that stuck with me. And I remember I'm like, Nick Holtz is offensive coordinator. Denard Wilson is defensive coordinator. Well, now you look at who they're surrounding themselves with on the staff. Way, way better job than Nathaniel Hackett did in Denver. Yeah. So that completes the coaching staff that we know so far as of this recording on you know, Monday, February 5th. We'll see if any more names come out before this goes live on A lot on more Tuesday. spots to be filled. A lot. <laughs> a lot more spots to be filled. I want to speculate quickly about one of them. Most of the coaches that were on Mike Vrabel's staff have been let go or already hired elsewhere. Justin Outen has not. Is there a chance that he comes back as a running back coach, run game coordinator? I think there is a chance, but it, I mean, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, look, I almost wrote an article. I didn't get it out in time, so I had to scrap it. I was going to write an article. Three coaches Brian Callahan should consider retaining. One of them was going to be Charles London, who he decided against, and he let him go. The other was going to be Terrell Williams, who's accepted a similar role with the Detroit Lions. And number three was going to be Justin Otten. So he's the one here that has survived so far and looks like he has a chance to survive 
I would like it. He, he's well-versed in the system. He has coached under a lot of coaches under that West Coast offense. Uh, under Matt LaFleur in Green Bay is a good example. I think, he, I mean, he was under Hackett in Denver. That didn't go well. But again, um, they both came from Green Bay with LaFleur. So I understand why that, you know, that, that happened. But uh, I think he's a smart coach. He's been exposed to a lot. He knows the system very well. I think it would make sense to keep him on board. With that said, I mean, look, he's got a great chance because he hasn't been let go yet, right? So right. That, that that's telling that there's a chance. With that said, uh, we don't know if anyone confirmed that Brian Callahan is keeping. He might just be holding on to him while he interviews someone else like they did with Shane Bowen, right? They held on to Bowen until they found someone to replace him. So we'll see which way it goes, but I do think Justin Auten's a good coach that should garner consideration. I agree. All right. So after hearing you talk about Frank Bush and Steve Jackson, I've decided to recall all of them all-star. This is a fully fully <laughs> all-star coaching staff. And I'm going to close this podcast out by talking about why and just going back to what you said earlier, because when I tweeted this, I tweeted that the Titans were assembling an all-star coaching staff and it kind of blew up on Twitter and found its way to Panthers fans who were quoting it and replying to it about how they had an all-star coaching staff last year. None of them knew each other. So I just want to reiterate the point you made <laughs> earlier and why this is so different is that, yes, these guys all have relationships to each all other. Then they And a lot of them also have relationships with Rand Carthon dating back to his time. Bernard Wilson does. Certainly. Exactly. Yep. So, yep. And we don't know if Brian Callahan and Bernard Wilson really knew each other that well or if Rand and Carthon maybe helped bring that one together. But um, the fact is they all have relationships with each other. The defensive side of the ball, we know they've all worked together. The offensive side of the ball has all in some way or shape or form worked together. So this is what separates them from Frank Reich's all-star sure. staff is that they are the, the collaboration aspect that I mentioned earlier. These guys are going to be collaborative because exactly they trust each other already. So anyway, any last thoughts here as we wrap up this coaching staff overview? No, that does it. I'd stop short of calling, you know, Frank Bush an all-star coach. There's some spotty stuff on the rest. Certainly last time he was here with the Titans. I mean, they didn't have a very good group at linebacker, but there was nothing out, you know, Akeem Ayers, Zach Brown, I think Gerald McGrath. Um, certainly nothing outstanding uh, there, but he's been coaching for a long time. I, I, I get the hire. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting back on here and talking about the rest of them. We need uh, a running backs coach, a tight ends coach. Uh, is Frank Bush doing all the linebackers? I like that Mike Rabel had it split up between inside and outside. There's such different positions nowadays. Uh, what happens with Chris Harris, who's probably not coming back, but we don't know for sure yet. Uh, so there's a lot that's still to be answered here. Uh, tight ends coach, I, I think I might have mentioned, but uh, there's a lot that needs to be filled here. So uh, this conversation is not exactly over with. Right. Agreed. So anyway, that'll do it for this one. Again, check out our Senior Bowl recap episode yesterday, talking with Zach Lyons, who was down in Mobile, gave us the scoop on what, what he saw there and guys that could fit Tennessee. We had a really fun philosophical discussion with that wide receiver versus offensive tackle at number seven there. So check that episode out if you missed it. We'll be back next week to talk more. I think, Justin, depending on how much Titans news we have to cover, we might finally get, get into our free agency you know who's who's going to be a free agent for the titans and should they resign them series but uh so we'll see what happens with that but anyway we'll be back soon until then y'all stay safe out there and tighten up a broadway sports media production